Leviticus chapter number 16. Book of Leviticus chapter number 16. It's kind of the, the central point of the book, but really a, a very important chapter in the whole Word of God, uh, Leviticus chapter 16. And we'll just read as our text, uh, starting in verse number 29. Leviticus chapter number 16 verse number 29 and this shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month or on the tenth day of the month you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And the priest whom he shall anoint, and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead, shall make the atonement, and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments. And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. He shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded. Well, tonight we want to look at this uh, uh, chapter of Leviticus 16 and look on this day of atonement. Um, Leviticus 16 does deal with the day of atonement. This was a one time of year, once a year um, event. One day out of the whole year um, is what would happen here on this Day of Atonement described in Leviticus 16. It's the beginning of the Jewish civil year. Um, Yom Kippur. So if you know, you're looking through your calendar and it says in the fall Yom Kippur, um, that's what that means. It's the, it is the Day of Atonement. Um, this year it starts on October 3rd. So it, it is a, a one, one day a year where, as we read, um, sacrifices were, were made as an atonement for sin. The Day of Atonement consisted of animal sacrifices of a bull, uh, two rams, and two goats. We find, as we read the summary statement there in our text, and, and that's what that was, a summary of everything that had to do, um, there were sins or atonements made for all kinds of different things. It wasn't just one animal sacrifice, and then that was it. Um, first, Aaron had to uh, offer a sin uh, sacrifice for himself. He, it, a bull or a bullock was a sin offering for the priest in his house. And then there were, had to be a ram for a burnt offering. And then there had to be a, a, a sacrifice for the congregation. Two kid goats for a sin offering a ram for a burnt offering for the congregation of Israel. There was an atonement for Aaron's house. There was an atonement for the sanctuary. There was atonement for all of God's people. There was atonement for their rebellious sins. There was an atonement for the sins of ignorance. So um, all these different things were, were offered there during that time. That was the summary. It says, In this day, in verse 34, shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And just right away, we see um, God uh, make, showing this is a, a very important uh, day out of the year. It was a, a day of required meditation upon the holiness of God. So a lot of the... Um, Festivals and the feasts that the Jews partook of were a day of rejoicing. They were a day of, of celebration. They were a day of, of worship. But here, um, this was not to be a day of celebration. It was not to be a day of, um, of jubilee and, and happiness and rejoicing. This was a day that God required um, as a day of repentance and fasting. It was a day where they were to, they were to fast, they were to repent, they were, it was to be a mournful day over themselves and their sins. 
It was a Sabbath day, so there, there, it was a day of worship, and it was a day of great pictures. But this was to be a solemn um, day. It was to be a day where they humbled themselves, where they um, bowed their, their knees, and a day that they set aside for repentance and, and fasting and meditation upon both the holiness of God and their sinful condition. You, as we read there, all that blood and all those sacrifices, as we read in the, in the summary, um, and, and all the, the sin that had to be um, atoned for, it was, they were to consider their sinfulness and the holiness of God. See, in the beginning of the chapter, verse number 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. So this, this starts right off the bat with the holiness of God. Um, that Aaron's uh, sons offered the strange fire to the Lord. They came in and they were going to worship God their own way. They were going to worship God the way they wanted to worship God, not the way that God um, had commanded them. And as they came in and offered the strange fire, God struck them dead. God killed them for their strength, for their strange worship, for their unauthorized worship. And then after the death um, of Aaron's sons, where God commanded Aaron that he could not mourn for them and he could not uh, show, uh, he couldn't rent his clothes and he couldn't go about the normal mourning process. He had to go on and just uh, keep on like nothing had happened because he was a picture of, of the priest. He was the, the high priest. He should be the holy one um, as far as uh, the holiest of the children of Israel. And, and he couldn't even uh, mourn for his children because they had uh, trespassed the law of God and gone in to, I believe, the holiest of holies presumptuously. And this chapter starts off with they have to make the sin offering to go back into that holiest of all and, and in a preparation for that. So that kind of overshadows this chapter that, that if you don't go into this place the right way, you are entering to the presence of a holy God. And, and God struck, um, he, he struck these men dead for entering into to God's presence and offering that strange fire. Well, this is a picture. It's a day of pictures, this day of atonement. This once a year picture was a picture of the offering of Christ. Year after year, it shows that they would never be able to fully appease the wrath of God for sin. You know, as the high priest would enter into the holiest of holies, and you know, you have, if you read this whole chapter, you find where he'll take the, the, the blood, and he'll take the blood in his hands, and he'll sprinkle it in some directions, and he'll put it on the horns of the altar. And, you know, when he comes back in there the next year, you know, if the same high priest is a high priest for 20 years, he's going to do this 20 times. And he's going to come back into the holiest of all, and there's going to be that stained blood from last year. And there's going to be, um, on the horn of the altar, he's going to you know, put the blood there again. And the, the stain of the blood is going to be there from last year. And year after year, he has to repeat this process. He has to repeat the process of the Day of Atonement. And then he's going to die, and his son will take over, and it'll go on. And his son, the first time he goes in there, is going to see the stain of blood already there. You know, it's not going to be a pristine and, and, and cleansed, but that, the stain is still going to be there. And he's going to see that, that he's going to have to repeat the process that has been done over and over again that they would never fully be able to appease God's wrath for sin. So the, the repetition of this um, day of atonement was pointing them, Israel, to, to know that it's never, they're never going to be able to do this enough until you know, God will say, all right, that the blood of those animals are enough. They would never be able to complete, um, fully satisfy God's wrath for sin by the blood of these animals. We see as the high priest enters in and mediates for the children of Israel, it points them to the great high priest, Jesus Christ, who is the mediator between man and God. The priest offered the animals, but Christ, our great high priest, was both the mediator and the sacrifice. 
See, that's the difference between um, the picture and the reality is Christ is our mediator. He is the one that goes in between for us. But Christ didn't offer animals. He offered himself. So Christ is both the tabernacle and he is the high priest, but he is also the sacrifice. So all these things are pointing to Jesus. The tabernacle pictured Christ where the atonement was made. Christ entered not into the tabernacle made with hands, but in his own body he tabernacled among us as the word was made flesh. And without the shedding of blood there is no remission. But you can see how this whole day was set apart as a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and his work of redemption for his people. So what we want to look at uh, now are those, um, are two of those goats, specifically the scapegoat. There was, and what was the purpose of those, um, those goats um, that, that uh, we find here? For, for one um, was, well, let's, let's just read it in um, chapter, verse number 7, Leviticus 16, 7. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So the high priest would prepare himself by washing and then putting on his priestly garments. Um, then he would take the two t kid goats. Um, one was for a sacrifice, and the other one is the scapegoat. And this, this was taken, as we read, from the congregation of Israel. So they took these two, scape these two goats out from the congregation of Israel. And that points us to the Lord Jesus Christ again that was born out of the nation of Israel. Christ was taken out from among the congregation of Israel. He was born of a woman. He was born of the, the he was the son of David. So the Lamb of God was brought up in the house of Israel. And these two goats were taken from the house, from the congregation of Israel. So it says in verse 5, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kid goats for the sin offering and one ram for the burnt offering. Well, verse number 8 says, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So we find that one of these goats were going to have to die. One of these goats were going to be the sin uh, sacrifice. The offering was according to God's providence. That it wasn't Aaron that chose the goat that would live and die, and it wasn't the congregation that chose which lamb would die, but it was God that chose. Um, the book of Proverbs tells us um, who's in control of casting the lots. It's God, and it was in God's sovereignty um, that God chose which goat would die and which would live. There's no other way of salvation besides the the choosing of God's righteous servant, Jesus Christ. So even in this picture, God's sovereignty in salvation is, is at the forefront. Um, people will say that um, you know, there's different ways of salvation from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and, and they'll try to put it to works in the Old Testament and grace in the New. Well, if you study the book of Leviticus, and if you, you really dig down into this chapter, Especially, you will find that God's uh, sovereign grace is covered uh, throughout the book of Leviticus, and especially in this chapter. It was God's providence, it was God's sovereignty in the choosing of um, which go would live and which would die. Then we find that the death was at, at the hands of men. Aaron cast the lots, Aaron took hold of the goats, and Aaron put the goat to death. It was God's choice. It was God's acceptance of the sacrifice. But it was man who laid hold um, of the goat and, and slew him. And it was man that laid hold of the Son of Man. But it was God that inflicted the punishment for sins. You know, man laid hold of the Son of God, but Christ willingly went 
to be part of God's eternal plan. Um, for a long time, um, I focused my thoughts upon what man did to Jesus upon the cross. And, and the Romans surely punished Christ, and they surely inflicted pain upon him. But what was really going on there at Calvary was not what the Romans were doing to Jesus, but what the Father was doing to the Son. That's the real focus there upon the cross. Because if you, if you think about it, when you read the, the gospel accounts of what happened on Calvary, there's very little information about what um, the, the physical pain. I mean, we know he was scourged and spat upon and beaten and, and the crown of thorns. And we know the nails pierced his hands and his feet. But it didn't go into great detail about what was what was happening there. And even in the epistles, as you go on to that, it's not a focus upon the physical pain and suffering, um, but the, the focus is upon what Christ was doing there on the cross, that he was being, he was a sin <coughs> substitute. It was what the Father um, was doing there, as illustrated in, or explained in Isaiah 53. So we have the plan and the purpose and the choosing was all of God. So why two goats? Why are there two goats? And what do these two goats mean? And why do you have to have so many animals on this day of atonement? Why couldn't they just have one lamb, kill the lamb, sprinkle blood, and that be it? Well, I believe both goats um, picture the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe they, they both are. And I, the reason why of these two goats, where you took the two kid goats, Aaron kills one, and then lets the other one go, um, I believe these both picture the Lord Jesus Christ. Because no man, no animal, no creature could fully picture what Jesus Christ has done. There was no single animal, no single man, no single sacrifice, no single building, um, no, uh, n nothing in itself could, could really fully picture everything that Jesus did. So, you know, you have, even in the tabernacle, all the furniture and all the different priests and all the different sacrifices are all pointing to different aspects of our Lord Jesus. Because, you know, there's not one goat that could be a full picture of everything that, that Jesus did there uh, on the cross. And, and not one man, Aaron, could, or his sons could fully encapsulate everything that our Lord Jesus Christ does for us. So, um, one animal was slain and the other animal was uh, set free. Uh, the word translated scapegoat is the name for this goat, Azael. And I don't believe that this was... Um, some people think that the, they, they offered this to the devil or they offered this goat to the demons and, and that kind of thing. Well, the, the, you know, There's no uh, application for that in, in God's word. I, that's just the name of the goat. that They took this scapegoat and they set him free in the wilderness. Well, they take both of these goats, and they bring him in both of them without spot, without blemish. The offerings of the lambs or the goats had to be without blemish. And it doesn't matter which offering, no matter male or female, some of them were only could be males um, for some sacrifices, but it had to be without blemish, without being crippled or scarred. Both were without impurity, and both were pictures of Jesus Christ's uh, sinlessness. Both goats were required, though, to have the full picture. Well, in verse number 11, Aaron shall bring the bullet for the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and his house, and shall kill the bullet for the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals from the fire, from the altar, from before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat, that he is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle the blood of his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullet, to sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place, 
because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And, and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to the atonement in the holy place until he come out, have made an atonement for himself and his, for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it. And shall take the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it around the horns of the altar. And he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanliness of the children of Israel. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation, he shall bring the live goat. So Aaron kills the bull, makes an offering for sin. He takes the censer of burning coals from the fire and brings it uh, within the veil. Aaron then puts the incense of the fire before the Lord, and that the cloud of incense covers the mercy seat so he wouldn't die. Aaron took the blood of the bull and sprinkled it with his finger, um, and then Aaron killed the goat of the sin offering for the people, the, the one that the lot fell on. So he cast the lots, and he killed the one that the lot fell upon, and repeated the process of the blood. This goat had to die for the sins of the people. This goat's blood had to be shed, not for something he had done. This goat didn't go and get in somebody's garden, or it didn't go and um, you know destroy property, or it wasn't mean and started hurting people and had to be laid down. This goat was innocent of any of any wrongdoing. This was a a pure goat without any defect that died because of the sins of Israel. It was a substitute. That God uh, required a substitute to, to die for their sins. Uh, and this is what this goat was. It was a sin offering. It was a substitute um, for them. Um, on Israel's account of all Israel's sins, blood had to be shed uh, for a covering. Aaron made the atonement for the holy place. We read there that he had to make an atonement for the, the holy place. He had to make an atonement for the tabernacle because of the children of Israel. Just because the children of Israel were close to the tabernacle, their sin had contaminated it. And Aaron had to make a, an atonement for the tabernacle itself. And then the congregation and the children of Israel, where they come to, to worship, atonement was made for the altar. So this day, blood was shed, atoning for sins. And the way to the holy place, the tabernacle, the place of worship, the altar, the places of prayer, the entire way of worship and coming to God was made only, it was only made possible by this blood. So from the outside in, that blood had to be offered and, and for God's people. So the whole pathway was covered in blood um, as they made their way to God. So let, let's consider the time we have remaining some more pictures that we have in this. So the, the one was presented alive. In verse number 10, the goat, the scapegoat, was presented alive um, unto the Lord. Christ was born, um, born into this uh, earth. He was, the word was made flesh, born of a virgin without spot, without blemish. And Christ can who was fully man, presented himself alive unto the Father. There was no other way of sacrifice. Christ had to come in the flesh, and he had to offer himself alive. He had to shed his blood. He, must, he had to be born, and he had to die. Some people say that God could have had another way, but I don't believe that God could have had another way. That, that this was the only way that God, um, this is the only way that our sins could be forgiven. Not through the blood of any animal, and only through the blood of the, the sinless Son of God. Well, the scapegoat was presented alive. Christ came in the flesh and gave his life for sin. Um, the blood, though, came before the scapegoat. The goat that was a sin offering was slain first before we get to the scapegoat. If there was no blood, there would be no remission of sins. The, of the two goats, the one that died had to be he had to die first before you even get before we get to the scapegoat. That one goat had to die. Christ had to shed his 
blood before our sins could be removed. Well, now we get to the scapegoat in verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their sins and all their sins putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities into a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. So here we find that the high priest would go to the scapegoat. So the one goat died, the blood was offered. Now we go over to this other goat, the one that God had chosen to live. And there was a confession made for all the iniquities of the children of Israel. It didn't say Aaron offered made confession for all the sins of all the people of the world. But there was a confession of the sins of the children of Israel. That all their idolatry and all their sexual sins and all their, um, all their murders and lies and, and thievery, it was all confessed. And it was God's people there. You notice that um, it says, He shall confess over them all the iniquities of the children of Israel. And all of their transgressions and putting their sins upon their sins upon the goat. That Aaron wasn't making an offering for sin for the Canaanites or the Egyptians or the Hittites or the Amorites or anybody else. It was God's people, it was the children of Israel, it was those who had come. So as he laid his head ceremonially on the head of the, the goat, it was for the sins of the, the people of Israel. The sacrifice was made for those to whom it was intended. And, you know, people, people want to deny God's sovereignty and salvation and, and election and the, 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 the atonement of Christ. Well, here we, we didn't find that God said, now make an offering for all the sins of all the people of all the world. No, the, the offering was made, an offering was given, confession was given to those to whom the sacrifice was intended. And as Jesus Christ died for sinners, he died for those for whom the sacrifice was intended. That he did not uh, offer and confess sins of all the people of all the world of all time, nor did he die and take away the sins of all people of all the world of all time, but he, he paid for the sins of God's people. Amen. This is what this picture is here. The hands were laid on the goat, and it shows the work of God. Um, that... Only God can uh, forgive sins. For the sake of time, we won't turn, but it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And all we like sheep have gone astray. Isaiah 53, 6 says, We have turned everyone his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's what this picture says. Aaron laid his hands upon that goat's head. That the sin of Israel that he had confessed was ceremoniously imputed onto that goat. That the, the sin was laid upon that goat. The, that we have the, the high priest make, making reconciliation. The goat bore the iniquity. So the picture is that the goat now has the sins upon him and he takes them out into the wilderness. Um, 1 Peter 2.24 says, who his, his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. So Jesus took upon him all of our sins. Our sins were laid upon the Lord Jesus. Now that goat went off into an uninhabited land and the fit man or the ready man that uh, took him there the sins are now laid upon the animal and they were taken away. And every work of iniquity that was confessed um, to God was laid upon the head of that goat. And the goat took it away. Took it to a place where there were no people and took it to a place where it would never be found again. So the ready man takes the goat and goes off into the wilderness. So the first goat pictures that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. That there can be no forgiveness, no covering, unless there's the shedding of the blood. Now this goat shows what, what happens with our sins, in the sense that the Lord takes them away from us. 
Hebrews 10, 16 says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. And I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So it's a complete removal of sins. It's not just a covering of sins, but it's the complete removal. As far as the east is from the west, so I think he removed our transgressions from us. That God has abolished our sins. He is the Lamb of God which taketh away sin, the sin of the world. He is the Lamb of God that shed his blood for the remission of sins, and he is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So the goat escaped alive. This goat didn't die. The first goat did die, but this one escaped alive. Christ died, but he didn't stay dead. And I believe this also puts us in mind of the, the, the resurrection. That Christ was victorious in his death, and he rose from the dead. Now, how could you picture the resurrection with one animal? You couldn't, because the goat's not going to rise from the dead. They took the animals and offered the blood and burnt the bodies. But this second one, I believe, shows that Christ was victorious in taking away our sins. So in all these animals, we have a picture of Jesus. The one that pictures his atoning work on Calvary, his shedding of his blood, the remission of those sin by his blood. The other one shows that when our sins are imputed upon Christ, that they are gone and gone forever. That Christ bore them for us and took away our sins that we are, we are clean. Our sins are gone. The accuser may accuse, but our sins are gone. Our sins were laid upon Christ and he took them away. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. This, as it says in Psalm 103.10, it doesn't say that God has not dealt with sin. It says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins. That Christ has dealt with our sins, but He doesn't deal with us after our sins. That the first goat died, and then the second goat removed the sin. Christ died and removed our sins and lives uh, victoriously risen from the dead at the right hand of the Father. This points us... Uh, and pointed Israel to the one who would come and complete this task. It points us to the Lord Jesus Christ who finished the work. That he did what all these animals couldn't do. He did what Aaron couldn't do. And that is, he, um, he finished the work. He, un he, he completed this task. Now the book of Hebrews points to this. And, and it says there's nothing back there anymore for the child of God. The book of Hebrews was written to the Jewish believers who were tempted maybe to go back into the old ways and get back into the, the sacrifices. But there's nothing left. Because Christ was the high priest of uh, good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, by his own blood, entered, he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth the purifying of the souls, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So this atonement that was made um, with, for Christ is the fulfillment of all those decades and hundreds of years of this ceremony. All the bloodshed and all the animals was pointing to this. That we can have peace with God through Christ. We are justified by faith and we might have peace with God. So, so we don't have to fear as Nahab and Abihu did with offering the strange fire. We're still, it's still a holy God. He's still the same holy God, but we have access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If God is... You say, well, what about... What about the Old Testament, and, and what about that, and, you know, God's love of the New Testament? Well, if think about it this, and then we'll close. If God is holy, and the picture of the Old Testament was, was to show God's holiness and God's hatred for sin, is the picture greater than the reality? Is the picture bigger than 
and greater than what the, rea the thing that it pictures. Well, no. The thing that it's pic the thing that is pictured or the picture is always lesser than what it pictures. You know, if I'm trying if I'm trying to give an example of something, what I'm giving an example is not going to be as good as the actual thing I'm trying to describe. You know, the actual thing is always greater than the picture. Well, in the Old Testament, you have a picture of God's holiness. And in Leviticus, you have a picture of his, his hatred for sin and his holiness. And the blood and, and what God required because he hates sin so much. And that's the picture. Well, that gives us an idea in the New Testament how much God hates sin and what Jesus Christ accomplished. Because you don't look at the Old Testament and say, well, that was Old Testament and, and God's not like that anymore. No, you look at the Old Testament and say, look how holy and righteous God was and how much God hates sin and all the things that they had to do to picture what Jesus Christ did. And then think, that's just the picture. That's just the illustration. That's what it was pointing us to Jesus. And then when we, when we turn from the Old Testament and look to Calvary, there we can see the, the fullness. And there we can see the reality of the hatred of God towards sin, His holiness and His righteousness. So uh, let's uh, rejoice in this uh, aspect of the Old Testament that God has given us so we can see what Christ accomplished for us. And let's uh, uh, close with a word of prayer and be dismissed.